Hello everyone, today I'm going to review Tower of God chapter 589, and wow, this chapter was something else. We have not gotten a chapter this packed in a while, and thank you to the translators for finally releasing this thing on Sunday again. Man, I really missed that. With all that said, let's get right into the chapter. So we start off with Rachel and Huaryun again. Huaryun warns Rachel that even if she does take her to where she needs to go, it's not going to work out for her, which I believe actually. I actually believe in Huaryun when she says that. It's not a bluff. I think Rachel is going to get a rude awakening when she finds out what is being hidden in here, and it, it is going to be one of her biggest regrets. We then move into pretty much one of the biggest reveals in this chapter, and it is Icarus again. We see some of the 10 great warriors in this faded panel, and I think it's Icarus, Urin, Kunad Wan, Traumarai on the very right, and I, I really cannot make out who is on the bottom. Now that I think about it, calling them the 10 great warriors is not really an accurate statement. There's because there's more than 10 warriors in this whole thing. So we see some of the enemies they were fighting. I really like the design of these zombie robot uh, enemies they were fighting against. And yeah, I think this is one of the reasons why Jihad locked up the floor above the 134th floor because they probably saw enemies that were way out of their league that there was just no point in climbing anymore. But for a story like Tower of God, I think that reasoning will be too shallow. I hope there's more reasoning behind this and it's not just because enemies are way stronger up there. And we also see that Icarus stated that every floor they passed, life bloomed. So it's pretty much a regulars clearing out the enemies and taming the tower in a way to start letting life prosper. As we reach the end of Icarus's chapter, we see V and wow, he looks exactly like Viol did back in season 2 at the very beginning. And Icarus specifically states, I was able to be together with the one I looked up to most. So this is pretty much insinuating that Icarus is an alias for Arlene. When Arlene was making this, she probably didn't want her real name to get out there, as Jihad was maybe keeping a keen eye on this, and instead she wanted to create a character that resembled her, that took her place in the story of the Ten Great Warriors. And Rachel also disguised herself as Icarus in the hidden floor, and yeah, her design looked exactly like Icarus looks like in this whole chapter, and the way Icarus describes V, really shows that like V was probably her love interest. And we know that Rachel has interacted with Arlene before, and it looks like Rachel is jealous of her, like that she's not the chosen one, and that Arlene is all beautiful and powerful and gave Bomb a very bright future, and Rachel cannot have that. And then we also see that Icarus admired V for being who he was. I mean, given that V was the only one who did not sign a contract of immortality with the administrators, I'm pretty sure that he had a very different mindset than all the other Ten Great family people, or their regulars, we should say now. So it looks like Icarus looks up to V as being kind of a god, since he's so much different than everyone else. She says that it might not even be her place to be beside him. And she also refers to him as being human, unlike all the other ones, and including herself. So it shows, at least it looks like, that V had a lot of empathy with everyone else. That he did not look at, look at himself like a god, like everyone else does except Urek pretty much in his tower, like all the regulars. Like even Gustang, Traumarai, Jihad, all these fucking people, they think they're gods. And it looks like V is the complete opposite. He didn't even get immortality, even though he qualified for it. And Icarus ends this chapter by saying, I wish to be beside him as we gaze into it, shining ever so brightly as I die. What I think Icarus means by this is looking at the outside of the tower, the stars, as Rachel has always said that she wants to see the stars. Maybe Rachel got so obsessed with Arlene that she even adopted her dream. So now we get to see Traumarai's reaction to this chapter. And he even says he's never seen this before. And he's trying to put the pieces together like who's Icarus and why have I heard that before. And it doesn't seem like it rings a bell. So maybe Traumarai just deleted all these memories. He really just deleted Arlene and V and maybe some other people into Leviathan. He just gave them to Leviathan and completely erased them from his memories. Now I see what they call him Traumarai because he always has so much trauma trying to remember all this shit. So now the new mission is to have the Kraken find out what the it is, which I'm pretty sure is outside of the tower. And, you know, respect the Traumarai because, you know, he can he can easily break through this this whole maze by himself. Like, he, he's not really kept in here forcefully. He's just playing along because, I mean, I kind of understand, like, what else can he do? I mean, I don't think he really cares at this point much about um, his family dying or anything that's going on. If he did, he would be calling Kieran right now and getting a checkup on the status of, of who's alive, who's dead. 
I don't, I don't think he really cares that much. So, I mean, this is the second best thing he can do other than participating in the war. And yeah, that wraps up that segment. That was insane. I'm so glad to see you finally dropped some more bits and pieces of this Icarus and Traumarai situation. I'm really looking forward into what the mystery is behind this. Why is Arlene hiding herself? Is it because of Jihad, the threat of Jihad, finding out that she's leaking some memories and information that him and the Ten Great Family leaders likely don't want to be leaked? But, I mean, then again, maybe the Ten Great Family leaders don't even remember any of this because they got rid of their memories doing their own methods. So maybe Jihad just wants to oppress everyone and have them living in this fairy tale land where they're ignorant to the past. And I also want to know what made V so special? What made V stand out from everyone else aside from not getting the immortality contract? Like, what did he do? that made Arlene look up to him like he was different from everyone else. Like what actions did he do? How did he act? Like what made V stand out? I think a saying stated a long time ago, I think this was in A Floor of Death, that he did not like V, he did not like Juvial Grace's father. And I wonder why, was it jealousy? Or the feeling of being inferior to him? Or what, like what was it? But yeah, that was an awesome segment. Now let's get into the battle with Dumas. So right off the bat, Bomb is here to gain Leviathan now. So Bomb still wants to fight, which I find a little confusing, but I'll get more into that later on in the chapter. And right in the next panel, we see Kalholam and So come out. Well, we don't see them right off the bat, but we see like their little warp attack come out. I thought that was Bomb when I first saw that. I thought Bomb was doing that. I was like, holy shit, dude. His Shinzu range is so far, but damn. No, I, I was about to be surprised. I thought that was Bomb using Leviathan to do another trick again. But yeah, they come out and Kalhalam starts shooting at Dumas and Richmond. So it looks like Dumas already knows that Kalhalam is a blue hole. He has some idea who he is. And at this point, I think they're freaking out that, like, God, there's already fug reinforcements coming. We need to get the fuck out of here. So yeah, Richmond gets all his barriers together and he makes a huge sphere. And then he brings out a ship from God knows where and they teleport out of a gate using Kalhalam's arrow to fuel it. So now we get to see how badly injured everyone was, and it looks like Yama is just fine. God, I thought he got the worst penetration from the blades, but no, he's just screaming over there. We then get an enormous reveal that Bomb successfully downloaded all the contents of the book. I thought he only got a few chapters or maybe a few pages, but no, he got the full book. How is that even possible? Well, I mean, I guess with Bomb, anything is possible, even reviving people partially. But anyways, this brings up the question of what I said earlier. So Bomb was about to use Leviathan to continue fighting. Why would you do that? If you already know you got all the book chapters and contents, why are you going to keep fighting? What's the point? You're going to, I mean, I guess it's not like a saying read the book, but if you already know what's in there, uh, isn't that more valuable than trying to take the book back and get more people killed or injured? Like, I think that was pretty rash. I think Bomb should have taken everyone else's health into consideration and not just keep fighting. So yeah, Yama comes back and he keeps yelling at Bomb and everyone else, even there is no fighting anymore. And Bam even says that, wow, if you can't even remember a page of a book, like what does that say about you? Like Yama is really dumb and he even questions if he's a high ranker, which is funny because like he hasn't done anything high ranker worthy. He hasn't killed anyone or, I mean, except Kaskar, but Yama sucks. Like he has been no help at all. And then we see Bomb standing next to Jin Sung Ha and Yama and God, he looks short. God, he's been floating and he's still shorter than Jin Sung Ha. I hope this guy grows a little bit more because Jesus Christ, dude, he looks really short here. He then foreshadows that something bad is going to happen because at the start of the book, Gustang wrote down, by opening this book of my own volition will signify that I wish for everything within the tower to be destroyed. Like, wow, I knew the book was important, but I didn't know that thing was a fucking ticking time bomb. Now I see why Lobanon wanted it so bad. I just wish he did a better job. I just wish CU did a better job of foreshadowing the book and hinting at its existence, rather than just throwing it in and making it really important all of a sudden and then giving it such an important reveal. So yeah, I really wish Bomb just took the time to break all these memories down. Like he got Leviathan's memories, he's got the book's memories. I'm pretty sure we're not gonna hear anything from the book for a while after this chapter. So I just wish Bomb just took the time like maybe a full day of breaking down all these memories, digesting them, because this is very important information. And I feel like he's not even considering how to use these memories or what to do with these memories or he just going with the flow when he has a lot of intel that he could be using to his advantage. Now we get into my most hated part of the chapter. God, this is really fucking stupid. So we go back with Rock, Kuhn, and Lobanon against the Kirin army, and they're trying to get Rock to fire his spear at the leader. 
So as Rock is preparing to throw the spear, we find out that he's not only comedic relief, but he's also as vulgar as Yama. As he's throwing the spear, he says, go fucking die, which is very aggressive for characters that got little to no dialogue and characters we don't even hate or know anything about. Like the Kirin army was just brought in to die and that's it. So I don't know why Rock had to be so aggressive with them. I mean, at the grand scheme of things, it's not really a big deal. It's a really nitpick, but I'm, I'm just saying like, why, why do you gotta be so aggressive, man? And of course, Rock gets his target and he kills him in one shot. Wow, so he killed the strongest Kirin army person there who should be advanced ranker level in one shot. A regular just killed a fucking advanced ranker in one shot. And it, like, it's like nobody is surprised. Like, we got such a huge reveal. It was it was such a huge reveal when Bomb defeated the Ranker and everyone was talking about it. And Rock just kills a fucking advanced Ranker and everyone just acts like it's another day. What the fuck is going on here? What where's the where's the world building here? I don't understand. Like is everyone absent minded all of a sudden? Like what the fuck? The only reaction we get is the guy with the guns. I've already forgot his goddamn name. He's always here saying, wow, these guys are pretty capable. And the Kirin army guys, they're like, oh no, we should run since we don't have a leader anymore. We didn't just witness a, a regular killing a high ranker or advanced ranker. Oh no, we should just run. Like none of that. Like nobody's surprised or anything. They're just following the path that CU is paving for them. And that's only part of the fucking issue I have with it. The other issue is killing a high ranker or advanced ranker, I should say. God, the same thing at this point. Killing them in the first place. How does Rock do that? Yeah, the spear. The spear is literally CU's only way of making this make sense, which it doesn't in the first place, because a regular should not be able to even fucking scratch a high ranker, or advanced ranker, or any type of ranker in this fucking story. The only person we've seen scratch a ranker when they were regular was Adori Jihad, and she was an A rank regular. And then we've also had Bomb, but he's in a regular, so it doesn't count. Why is Rock having these feats all of a sudden where he can just one shot rankers? That doesn't make any sense. He shouldn't even have the throwing power to chuck the spear hard enough to penetrate through a fucking ranker's head. And if the spear is really this powerful, there should be a restriction on it. There were restrictions before, now we never see them again. How convenient, right? There's no more restrictions on these fucking weapons. And if this weapon is that powerful where it can close the gap between a regular and a ranker, that weapon should be taken away in the workshop and it should be fucking locked away because nobody should have a weapon that powerful. This has never happened in the history of Tower of God where regulars have killed high rankers. CU is just watering down his story's world little by little and it is terrible. This is horrible fucking writing. But after all that bullshit happened, we then see Lobodon reacting to a warp gate, which Lobodon doesn't even know. He doesn't even react to Rock killing an advanced ranker, but him and Hugo react to the ship and the other Pobodal guy reacts to the ship too that just warps in randomly. So yeah, I think they're gonna try to kill Lobodon's army with uh, the Shinzu Black Hole Sphere and maybe Kirin is gonna get there soon as well. And yeah, as we get into the next segment, we see that Bomb already was going back to Lobodon's, uh, Lobodon's place. So we might see this whole conflict with Lobodon, Kirin, and Bomb happen in a few chapters from now. So we see Jin Sung Han and Kel Halam start talking about what they've learned and what they've seen. And they we learn also learned that, that Karaka already had his armor destroyed, which I'm surprised. I thought Karaka was near immortal, but I guess the armor can only be destroyed so many times. It looks like they're heading to the headquarters and then we see this person come out with the wings. So I think people are getting a little confused here. I think this person with wings is not anyone really important. I think this person is pretty much like the gate watcher, like the guard or something. And it's not really anyone like important at all. Just like when the Po Badao family ship stopped at Chioni Ha's warship and they captured Rachel and Yura. We saw that guy come out with uh, bunny ears, I think. He had like a scarf, the Po Badao guy, and he read a message to the people in there. And he's just a messenger. He's not really anyone important. At least we haven't seen him ever since then, right? But it it's just a messenger. It's just someone who keeps watch. I don't think this is anyone important. We then see that messenger refer to the person she's talking to as Grace, Lord Grace. So finally, finally, we might see Luzlik really soon. Maybe next chapter, maybe in the chapter after next chapter. Finally, we're gonna see one of the most powerful fucking people in this story. Not only powerful, but very important and very cryptic. I mean, the ending was very cryptic. His whole text box is all twisted to begin with. Yeah, you know, I really wish Bomb stayed on the ship. I would like to see Bomb interact with Luzlik. I mean, Bomb already interacted with Traumarai and Gustang. He's already interacted with these irregulars before. I don't think Luzlik is that much farther from them in 
terms of status and power, and I would like to see Luzlek's reaction to Bomb with his feats and what he thinks of him, and if he really thinks he can defeat Jihad. So yeah, that was an amazing ending, revealing one of the most anticipated characters we've been wanting to see for many years now. So yeah, it is heavily foreshadowed that a family leader will be dying at this chess game, and I thought the chess game was cancelled, but it looks like it's still going on. Uh, we all know it's not going to just be an innocent chess game, it's actually going to be very dangerous and lethal and one of these fuckers might die. And it looks like Luzlik wants to observe, which I thought Luzlik would be one of the people in the forefront. But yeah, this this is setting up a lot for the future. God, if we go another highest before this shit starts, I'm going to be so upset. Hopefully not though. Overall, I really like this chapter. This chapter was amazing. I just hated the rock part. Man, I hate it when Siu just writes brain dead things like that. But there's so much going on now in Tower of God. Like I said last chapter, we keep getting more and more reveals. And I just hope Siu starts closing some of them up before we get into another hiatus. We still need the water dragons. We got this Icarus stuff still going on with the sky and what that it is. And we got this Lobodon and Kieran stuff. Um, we got... Luzlik now. Luzlik is in the story. There's way too much stuff going on. I just hope see just hyper focused on one chapter and one fucking segment. See if we can start closing things off. With all that said, feel free to leave your comments below. I appreciate reading any comments you leave and I will always respond to them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next chapter.